Well, I need to have some tuning because it hasn't been tuned since it's been moved a couple of times, but yeah. It needs a lot of support. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
you're hungry enough. I'm hungry now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go get some synthetic coffee and <laughs> synthetic dog <coffee>. soup burger. <laughs> <laughs> and have a synthetic good time. <laughs> a little barbecue sauce will fix it. <laughs> and uh, don't eat it on bread. Ketchup, whatever, yeah. Hot sauce. Hot sauce fixes Tabasco. everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, that fixes everything. That loads everything. That'll even make dog food taste good. <laughs> that'll kill whatever's in there that kills you. <laughs> yeah, the bacteria too. <laughs> I haven't had lunch yet, so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Oh. I don't want lunch enough. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, yeah. oh, wait. Here's my nephew does too. He's addicted. This is the cheapest thing you can get. You can get a dollar and a half. A dollar and a half for hot dog that time. Well, then you drink two dogs. Here we go. Hot dogs? Hot dogs? Hot dogs. I mean, and they're like that big. It's like eating a sausage. Oh. Yeah, they're full. They're all beef. I was, I've, I've never tried one. I've seen them, but they look like they're all beef. Yeah. I think they are. Yeah. Not yeah. Mike said they're not as good as they used to be. I don't know, but he's very picky when it comes to that. I'm not so. I just cut back on the line, unfortunately. I just envision putting it on my hands. Swell. I gotta say, we're I'm moving us so forward into chapter 16 <laughs> of Judges. Kind of skipping over a couple, just because. I'm going to ride on the theme of Samson and his pride. Chapter 15, he just gets really mad at the Philistines and pulls out a can of, you know what, with a donkey's jaw. And uh, again, broke his vow, touching the dead thing. So it was always expedient and convenient for him to do so. So that, that's really what you see. We got the, I think we talked a little bit about, um, yeah, we did 14. 15 is just a, kind of a, an in-between segue of showing his pride and his uh, prowess coming through and his, I think, lack of disregard to, to the Lord's uh, wishes for his life and being in control. Now we get into chapter 16, which is probably the character we know most of when it comes to Samson is... Uh, Delilah. And we're going to focus on that. First 19 verses. You want to read it quietly yourself, or somebody want to read eight verses and somebody else can read nine to 19? Who wants to read one through eight? No. All right. <clears throat> Samson and Delilah. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went in to her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here, and they surrounded the place and sat in ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait until morning, till the light of morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. After this, he loved the woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came to her and said to her, Seduce him, and see where his great strength lies, and by, why, by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had been lying. Now she had been lying in ambush in, in her chamber, and she said to him, "The Philistines are upon you, Samson." But he snapped the bowstrings as a flax thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. All right, anybody want to finish the chapter? Or at least up to 19, rather. 
Mm, I can. Dick, are you ready? I think so. There's no two okay. crazy names. Just See. Delilah. Delilah, yeah. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll begin as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as they were threats. Delilah, Delilah then said to Samson, All this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. How you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my hit, head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep, pulled up the pin, and the loom with the fabric. And then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. <laughs> he told her everything. Now, no razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she went, sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After pulling, putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his head, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. All right, thank you. And Is this the definition of a fool? Samson. <laughs> Samson. <laughs> After the first time, I just got a fool of his hair or soon parted. Sorry, Don. I'm just saying that, you know. How many times? Pretty Foolish pride. pride. That's what we have in Well, do you really not think that he thought he would still be strong? Uh -huh. Did he not realize that she was going to do something? And I think it got to the point where he figured, uh, you know, even if she were... I'm so full of myself. Yep, he had oh. lost sight of well, where his true... Well, on you. <laughs> kind of the lesson we learned from Samson, you know, a, you know, a pride and a fool in his pride. <laughs> they go down together, and his money soon leaves him, mm. as well as his hair. Um, but if you go back to chapter 1, or chapter 16, verse 1, Samson goes to Gaza, what... Well, What's he go there for? His marriage falls apart. He gets ticked <coughs> off, takes it out on the Philistines, and acts like a, a very vicious thug in doing so. Um, and then he goes to Gaza. And well, he's not a the, humble the, messenger. He's he's not a humble full messenger. Of him, he's full of himself. And what what was the point of his trip to Gaza? Get laid. See. Sorry, uh, find a to be so rude. You know, that, that was exactly it. <laughs> my wife, uh, my marriage is gone. I'm ticked off, and I gotta go let off some steam. So I'm going to Gaza. His first trip to Gaza was to commit sin. He deliberately went there looking for a prostitute, and and they all heard the rumor, and they all saw this guy being this proud, vindictive, haughty, you know, playboy and. Nobody liked him. He had a horrible reputation. Yeah. He decides he's, um, if he'd uh, got a prostitute in Israel, they'd have had the stone. Exactly. Well, that's true, too. So he went where he could get away with it. Mm -hmm. And so he deliberately sought out sin and went where he shouldn't to be able to find it convenient. And there's a lesson there for us, you know. Why do we end up in sin sometimes? Because I go seek it out. Flee from it. Mm -hmm. But when you go chasing it, you know, don't be surprised when it catches you. And there was a, a, you know, a, a, a very poignant hatred towards Samson. I think it was partly jealousy and partly revenge. And I think partly their pride had been, had been damaged. I mean, he takes the Philistines and really ekes out some serious vengeance on them, you know, in chapter 15. You know, he, 
He ties all the torches to the foxes' tails while they're standing in the grain and runs them through and you know, basically wreaks havoc on it. He takes the jaw of, a, of, a, of an ass and he you know, takes down a thousand of them in one, one skirmish. And again and again, proving himself to be powerful, but... So the Israelites don't really like him, they just... Uh put up with him because he's taking care of things? Well, <laughs> taking care of things. <laughs> and it wasn't really the Israelites that had an issue with as much as the Philistines. Right, but they were just long for the ride. So, yeah, and the Philistines really hated him because he kept making a mockery of them. Right. And uh, I think there was more hatred towards Samson from the Philistines than, than the Democrats have for Trump right now. Right. And I just use it as a no. That's very possible. But you look, I think there's a comparison there. There, there is. President Trump comes across as rather haughty and self assured and sometimes says things that maybe he shouldn't say, but he says it anyway. And Mom, he's minding him you know, down and beating him with jawbones either. I bet he'd like to. Uh, maybe too. Right? Uh, he's been one of them. Well, in, in, a, in a way, maybe he is. I don't know. In a, in a, in a, do they deserve it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't bring it up to make any sort of indictment against our president or comparison Samson, but how? No, because but my point is how groups of people can quickly turn on one individual right. because. But you're right because state. Samson wants to be one of them in some ways because he likes to participate in their, <coughs> their style of living. Yeah. So he wants to be a Philistine, at the same time he's happy being, so he's playing both sides of it. And in a lot of ways, like you said, Trump's done the same thing. He's paid for Democrats and Republicans through his lifetime, so. And, and uh, yeah, I'm not trying I don't think he's party affiliated other than for this election. I think, you know, mm -hmm. Samson was for himself. Right. The only skin that was in the game was Samson's game. Mm -hmm. And Samson's skin. And that was where he always focused. Okay. He was a bit of an arrogant renegade. And uh, they <laughs> did not like him, and they wanted to take him out. And I just have on the sheet there, after Samson's marriage falls apart, did he change the other women he went after? No. Did he change? Well, he seemed more, well. I think he changed in the sense he went from bad to worse mm -hmm. for a while. But he wasn't exactly upright when he found his wife to start with. Right? I mean, he went somewhere where he, he went over uh, the other side of the fence, in essence, Yeah. to find her. And when that fell apart, you know, and he kind of, he, he sort of got the wages of his own lust instead of trusting in God and repenting and saying, yeah, that was, the, that was a bad choice, he went and just repeated it and chased again after his sinful passions. And, and it's interesting as you follow through this, you know, the name Samson we talked about before from Shemesh or Samson in Hebrew for light or sun, and then Delilah, Lalia is light, and De is to have the absence of light. So you have Samson who is light, and you have Delilah who is darkness. And that's what both of their names mean in Hebrew. So you see a little bit of a struggle there, a power play. Samson is supposed to be the guy representing light, and Delilah is his darkness. Well, he's pretty shady. Delilah's shady. She lives up to her manipulation. Right. And uh, God gave Samson great privilege and power and he wasted and squandered mm -hmm. it on selfish desires. Yeah. And you know, we look at the discussion of ourselves in relation to, to Christ. And I have the classic section from Philippians 2 which talks about the antidote to pride which is the humility of Christ, where Paul makes the connection in your relationship with each other. Be like Christ. Do not look for equality as something to be grasped, but how the Lord made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, obedient even to death on a cross. And, and I look at that comparison there, if you could think about it, what do you think it was like for Jesus to leave heaven and become a human? Yeah. You would think you'd say, Dad, do I have to? <laughs> yeah, you think, but but he he didn't. He said, Here I am, Dad. Send me. You're right. 
He was willing to do this, but to leave the glory of heaven to come to this sod and to put up with the likes of us. And what did he give up? He gave up being praised and worshipped by angels to become mocked and derided and accused and beaten by men. Pit of snakes. Pardon? In a pit of snakes. That'd be a pit of snakes. Yeah. He gave up the That's glories right. of heaven for a pit of vipers. Yeah. Who attacked him? Yeah. And yet, what do we gain through his humility? You know, we gain the status of heaven as our home. Um, what did Samson gain through his pride? A lot of hurt. And a, and a, a path of hurt. A lot of people in his wake that he had hurt. And yet God still had, had accomplished his will in the end. And in the end, Samson would prove to be the Lord's servant, whether it was you know, a willing participant or not, all, in, in all action and, and effort. But in the end, God gets his way. You know, Jesus still wins. Um, it's best to go with him willingly rather than kicking and screaming. And, and Jesus never kicked and screamed, though, as he fulfilled his Father's will for us. See, I, I know what you're saying, do I have to, Dad? But Jesus was the one who said, Dad, here, I have an idea. Send me. I'll go. And those are parables that we hear in the Bible. And the, you know, even Jesus talked about it. You know, the, the king sends all the servants to the to the wicked people who you know, basically put his city under siege. And well, I'll send messenger after messenger, and, and they kept killing them. Well, I'll send my own son, and they'll listen to him, and surely they'll reason, and then they kill him. And you know, that's just this prediction of what would happen. And it's the humility of Christ in the face of the pride of people. And there is that power struggle. And Christ is our answer and antidote to those things. And we gain so much through his action because of what we've lost on account of our own actions. And in our culture, though, humility is a weakness. This is perceived. But in what ways did Jesus' humility convey strength? He was in control the whole time. Sure. And, but he didn't use that control. He chose to, to empty himself of it. Mm -hmm. And chose to not rely on what he could do. Rather, he submitted himself to humble service to his father. And, and how does that actually require strength, though? Because what was at the heart and core of Jesus' humility? Or who better was at the heart and core of the motivation for Jesus' humility. Was it himself? We were. Yeah. And what was at the heart and core of Samson's pride? <laughs> himself. <laughs> and, and which is stronger? To be pride and boastful of self? Or to be quiet and restrained and humbly just serve without praise from others? I think restraint. It takes a lot of strength. Doesn't Sometimes resistance, we want to lash out resistance takes strength, doesn't it? It's easy to just <laughs> lash out and well, I'll give you what's for. And I feel justified in doing it. Man, that feels good for a second. Because our, our victories are very shallow and short lived. And, and it's never really justice, it's vengeance that we're acting out and, you know, in, a, in a vendetta type of way. I don't have the right to take out my frustrations and meet out my, my perceived justice on someone else just because I think so. That's God's job, ultimately, through whom he uses and how he uses. So we're not supposed to be Charles Bronson. We're not supposed to, you know, have death wishes against people. Vigilantes never end well. <laughs> and it takes a lot more strength to be humble than it does to be proud. <clears throat> We're all kind of default setting proud, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way... Well, hurt evokes the pride, too. So when somebody really hurts you... Yeah. You want to, you know, your pride well, says... Flash back. Or lick your wounds and make sure everybody sees how hurt you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wallow in your defeat. 
as a way to get attention. <laughs> and, and yet Christ did none of that. You know, it does take strength to resist. Why do so many people fall into the, the ploys of Satan's regime? In the sense of falling into his traps and his tests. Because they don't have any strength. Yeah. Remember what James says, resist the devil and he will flee. But we have to resist him. And that's hard. But I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When I turn to him and ask for his help in this, he does help us. I think a lot of times we doubt his ability to help us, which is then why I don't think we always get the help that we could. James says you do not have because you don't ask sometimes, and you don't ask in faith. And therefore, the Lord allows us to, well, I love you, so I'm going to let you sit in it for a while. And, and, and it happens. And I think Sarah's is a good example of somebody that the Lord allowed to sit in it for a while. He, was, he made him sit in his own mess for a while to learn humility through the destruction of his pride. And, and yet, it's so much, so much more beneficial for us to be humble than proud. And there's greater strength and resilience out of resistance that comes as we fight those selfish impulses to feed pride. Paul's pointing us to Christ. And I think there's a healthy balance. I mentioned that on the, on the sheet there that um, when you look at it, we don't want to think too highly or too little of ourselves. Because there's a balance there. And I think both can be sinful attitudes. I think we get the one about thinking too highly of ourselves, but how about thinking too little of yourself? How could that potentially, in a backdoor kind of way, be pride? Well, it can be an excuse to do all the sinful things you want to do because you think so little of yourself. Or So you don't hold yourself to a standard. Yeah, don't hold yourself to a standard and, you know, I'm so bad, this, you know, this, this, this is what you should expect from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yep. Yeah, uh, I'm a horrible you. person, so I'm going to do horrible things, and you know what, don't be surprised. This is what you get, self-fulfilling prophecy. Or we have so little um, regard for ourselves that we don't do the things we know we could do. Well, it's an escape from having to do anything righteous. Yeah, yeah. And righteous is the right word, because that's not self-righteous. Righteous right. is the, the right <laughs> things that I know are good and beneficial for me and others, right. even though they're not pleasant, they're good. And, and, and it is, it's a pass. Now, who am I? I, I who, who am I to do anything to help? Mm -hmm. I'm just little old me. What could I do? And I think we learned that one from Gideon. Hey, I'm the least of the least, the worst of the worst. Just kind of hide my wine. And, well, it's but, like you said, it's a forward to say, don't expect anything from me. I'm not going to... For good or bad, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, when you walk through this chapter, it's just so interesting. You, you look uh, how Samson's pride plays out. Um, you know, uh, Samson is, is in the house. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 16, uh, they made no move during the night. At dawn, we're going to kill them. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. He got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate. <laughs> so what's, what's the deal? So first of all, he's laying there. What, do you, what is he doing while he's laying there? Don't let your imagination go too far into the gutter. But he's not just hanging out going... Planning. Mm -hmm. And as he's planning, he's also enjoying his prostitute. He's not just laying there and scheming. He's, he's, he's involved in some sexual escapades here. He's uh, enjoying every bit of the gratification of flesh that he is given. <coughs> but he enjoys the battle, I think, as well. He, well, and to him, the sex revenge. is a battle. But I'm just saying he enjoys the revenge as well. Why do people go to a prostitute? Release. Because they feel impotent and powerless with their spouse, so they got to go somewhere where they can have control over someone else in a sexual manner. And I'm in control. I'm buying you. I'm paying for this. You will do as I say. You will, and, and, and it's really just a warped, twisted power struggle. And Samson, sex, and war were his power struggles. 
Why does he take the gates of the city and tear them down? What's he basically saying to the Philistines and everybody in Gaza? Keep taking your defense away. Yeah. <laughs> for one thing. Because that's what they were basically for, is defense, although in this case it was the, they figured they'd keep them in the city. <laughs> no. It, yeah, they, it's kind of hard to keep them in the city when you take away the doors. Yeah. <laughs> and in a way, what is he saying about the Philistines? In his mind, they were impotent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when he carries them 40 miles away. Yeah. So let me show you what I could, ha ha, just for good measure, just to add a little insult to injury, I will, I will go place these up on this hill, and you're all going to see it, and you're going to wallow in it, and just as I conquered that prostitute, because by golly, that oh, failed marriage, yeah. he's ticked off by the marriage failing, because he didn't have control over that. So he goes and finds a woman with whom he can have control, and now he demonstrates his power and his potency by showing the Philistines, you are, you basically are impotent to me. You're a eunuch. I, I am the guy in control. Just as I conquered that prostitute, I will conquer you. But all along, he's got a sexual and spiritual dysfunction. Carry the trash can that far. Yeah, who could carry the trash they built? He took the trash on wheels. <laughs> Now, as he falls in love with this woman named Delilah, um, we don't hear any evidence of any relationship other than they fell in love and, you know, they're just shacking up and she becomes his mistress. Um, and then, 100 shekels. 1,100 shekels, sorry. Yeah. About eight years wages. So, man, we're, we're really putting the money on the line to get this guy. Mine says, each will give you, so I don't know how many lords of the Philistines there were, but that was quite a wow. sum of money. It's more than one single eight years worth of wages. There could have been, you know, 50 years of wages or 100 years of wages between everybody. So we're, not, we're talking about a big bounty. And, and yet this whole discourse, and, and I just react to Jenny's, what is he, a fool? <laughs> <laughs> you walk through this back and forth game. Well, he has a lousy choice of women to fall in love with, for starters. <laughs> and then he seems to be duped by them. Because he has a poor understanding of God's role of sexuality and relationship and and, and power and all that. And, and yet he likes, does he like playing this game, do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you get the feeling he likes being in control? Mm -hmm. The way he just toys with them? Well, he thinks he's manipulating her, and in the end, he... Outsmart Go ahead. Him. Well, how was he being a judge in doing this stuff? It's a good question. <laughs> it's not. So, in other words, for 20 years they were they didn't have they had nothing. Own. They were just on autopilot. They were ready doing yeah. their own thing. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, the theme of the Book of Judges: everyone did what was right in his or her own sight. Right. Basically, he was harassing the Philistines for 20 years and taking their mind off of harassing the issue. Yep, so he was, he was running interference. Interference. Huh? And that was his idea of leadership. You know, I'll just go toy with your enemies for my own self-centered purposes, <laughs> and therefore you won't be at war. And so the Philistines were just focused on, gotta get that guy out of the White House. <laughs> so thank you, Trump, for running interference because our economy is actually doing pretty well. And the Democrats aren't toying around with all their social programs and, you know, social experiments on all of us with, you know, let's see if, if shrimp can run on a treadmill and create electricity or whatever goofy things we throw money at that I've seen pictures of. <laughs> so, again, I don't want to make too many Trump comparisons. <laughs> you see how this plays out in history and in real life. Um, my enemy's enemy is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that means. And then you are my enemy. Exactly. Yes. And that will come too. <laughs> so it seems like he likes to play this game, and he's it's, he's trying to prove, you know, that that he can control. Again, he's, why is he playing this game with Delilah? Who is Delilah? She's another Philistine woman in his life. Yeah. He well, tried to control the marriage from the beginning. I'm going to go, I like her, because I chose her. And he tried to control it, and it didn't work well. 
now the prostitute he controls, the Lila he controls, because, and as he controls the Philistines, he's saying, I can control you, and look, I can control these women in my life, I can control you, I'm bulletproof. That's how he ends up falling. Well, that, to me, the overall theme is, you know, people always say love is blind, but to me, hatred and revenge is blind. I mean, literally in this sense, because they blind him in the end, and he still kills more in the end. So as each side is hating, they're losing, yeah. and they're blind to the whole thing. And, it, and he does eventually literally <coughs> become blind to it all, and that's only finally then when he, you know, fulfills what God wanted to do, and that was to send a shot across the Philistines' bow, and he does in this party breath. But in essence, isn't he just play, isn't he praying for one more revenge? Act yeah. of revenge? Calls out the Lord in the end, yeah, to pull them pillars down. And yeah. And, and he's like, okay, I'm good with it. I screwed up royally. She so asked a question. Ask your question, Barb. Was that suicide? Oh, Samson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, suicide, sacrifice. I, I, you know, a kamikaze running into <laughs> the side of a ship. Yeah, it was like a war. Uh, you know, getting shot in a war. And. And he was a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did not do that in a, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize it as the typical case where we now look at why people commit suicide out of hurt and he, he, was, he was trying to do that too. He didn't see his life getting better. No. He's blind, he's imprisoned. It's like, and then he's he a kind of pilot. It's kind of like, I'm collateral damage and I'm good with that. And Lord, <laughs> I'm just a cog in the bigger picture now and I understand that finally. And so I screwed up all along. But do you, help help do me you, be the judge in the end that you wanted me to be by doing something that will save your people. And if I sacrifice myself to do it, I sacrifice myself to save them. But do you really see this as a noble act? I see it as just an act of revenge. Can this strength one more time to take more, yeah. cause more harm? And is that an act of war? And isn't war aggression? And uh, the one with the biggest bomb wins, and the guy with the strongest arm wins, and 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 that is violence and oppression and aggression until it finally causes the other side to cease too. So God was okay with this because He already felt that the Philistines were lost. In in, in a sense of that salvation, salvation, or in the sense of attacking the Israelite people and in rules of engagement in war, God allows us to play that out. So maybe he's evening the field. Evening the field, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I don't think he could have done it unless God gave him the strength. True. So, and he does ask the Lord, remember me, and just give me one more time so that I might get revenge so like for my true eyes. Maybe the whole thing is that he, he actually came to the Lord finally. And asked for it. Ultimately, gave himself to the Lord and asked for the Lord to work through him. But there was a little bit of a, I lost my sight, but now I finally see. I was acting stupid. Okay, Lord, I'll sacrifice myself to save my people from further war and bloodshed. So I'm going to die, and they're going to die. But it's finally going to bring an end to the war. Right. And it will save others from dying. But it doesn't really reflect that he was remorseful of anything else he did. Well, I don't know. And I don't yeah. know if that's really the point of the story for us to, you know. Right. I would, I'd love to be able to psychoanalyze Samson, but we're not allowed to. Um, just like, you know, dropping the bomb on, on Japan. It was a mighty act of aggression, but it was meant to finally stop further bloodshed. So the shedding of blood sometimes is the only thing God allows to stop the shedding of blood and the final desperate act. Well, I wouldn't do it in this day and age. No, I, <laughs> too many people have their hand on the button. When you're the only one with the bomb, right. well, it's a little different. But when everybody's got one now, <laughs> you, you know, you don't want to walk into a Western tavern, you know, in, in South Dakota during the 1800s and pull a pistol because <laughs> you're not the only one packing. <laughs> well, Pastor. I'm reading that, and it sounds like to me, that's just me, is, you know, the Philistines were making uh, fun. fun of his God. Yeah. And he says, well, 
Put me between these pillars and I'll pray to my God and see what happens. You know, I'm going to take you guys out because you made fun of my God. Maybe. You know, I don't and know. You look at I, it, it, what it sounds like to me is, is it's not... So who was who was who was yeah. Samson finally standing up for? God. All along, who was he standing up for? Himself. And you notice, this is the first time in this account you actually hear Samson use "O oh, Sovereign Lord," the full name of God. Finally, as if I finally get it, and I'm a changed man, and I'm offended by they mocking you. I was mocking them, playing and toying cat and mouse for my own sinful pride and purposes. That's not what you wanted me to do though, and I'm sorry Lord, and I'm a changed man, and use my parting breath now to to vindicate you. And so I will sacrifice myself, and yes, I'll sacrifice these Philistines if that's what you want, but stop the, the mockery of your name, put an end to the persecution and the war that's going on so that there's no more hostiles and there's no more victims. And that's how I put that. It's not so much a suicide as a his last attempt to say, not to redeem himself, but to vindicate himself mm -hmm. and say, yeah, I've changed. Vindicate God. And to... Was well, it understood between the countries that the ones defeated the others because their gods were better, better yeah. than the other ones? And so... He, Samson yielded his life, and I think in doing so, um, he's showing us that he's given, he's given, he, he kind of gained hold of the whole purpose for why he was born finally. You know, he yielded his life and finally kind of coming into recognition of, of the vow he was put under. He was put under the vow to rescue the people. And Samson screwed it up along the way enough that God said, okay, you've messed this up so much, the collateral damage is, the consequence is, you. And Samson was okay with it. The thing was, that, that transformation didn't happen on that. He spent quite a bit of time going around and around that grinding rock. Yeah, yeah you think, uh, you know, spending time as a mule, grinding stones, and, and uh, on the, that's got to give a guy pause to think about how is this working for me? Well, not so much. The higher you are when you fall, <laughs> the harder it hurts when you land. Yes, well, he landed pretty low. And, and, and I, I'm glad you brought that up, Dick, because that's really one of the things I did want to mention as we walk along is, you know. All he asks for is the Lord to remember him. And he calls on the name of the Lord. That's the tetragram. This is the, the I am God. He finally calls on the Savior God. Before it was the God in my back pocket, the genie God, the, uh, the God. I own you, you don't own me God mm -hmm. concept. And now he finally realizes whom he's serving. And in his last at Jeopardy, he gives his life in service. Is that suicide? I don't think that's a suicide in the typical sense of despair. Yeah. I think it would be. But it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, just, uh, it just struck me when I was reading it, you know. And he sacrificed himself. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if we're going to call that suicide, we could call missionaries that go down to this country where they know they got the possibility to get killed, and they do. Is that suicide? No. Mm -hmm. Or a guy who throws himself in front of a bullet that's being uh, shot at one of our leaders, you know, a bodyguard. Is that suicide? Throwing themselves in the sacrifice. line of fire. We, we, we honor them and call it sacrifice. Um, but he's calculating well, the risk. Well, sacrifice. Bye, Barbara. Bye. Thank you. Say hi to Michelle. I will do that. She's going to call you soon. Okay, thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the cards, too. Oh, Barbara, by the way, you have a second? Real quick, the cards, um, we had an occasion where one of the cards, birthday cards we saw, because we're sending them out to the kids. Well, there was one kid I heard about from, from the parent today, had a really bad day at school because all of her classmates were wishing this other kid who had the birthday 
happy birthday, but not her. I felt really bad and awkward, uh, and then came home and got our card in the mail. Oh, and it made her day. Our mistake, no, no. <laughs> her friends were purposely avoiding her and isolating her. Was and, friends, friends and it was all on social media <laughs> and purposely not wishing her a happy birthday and ostracized. And she came home and got our card in the mail, and, and the, the dad said she just she felt had loved. tears in her eyes. Oh. They remembered me. Right. So thank you for the work. Which goes back to girls and feelings. Girls and feelings. And, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Barb. As well, let you know your stamps are not in vain. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a nice story. And, and yeah, girls and drama. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a teenage girl today. I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> oh, not being bold. Oh, that's good to know. A teenager in general. Yeah, I, should, are, I shouldn't caveat with the girls, but a no, teenager in general. Having three grandsons, I can tell you that the times have changed. And I have, you know, teenage boys that are trying to get teenage girls, and it's really hard. <laughs> well, the teenage girls are relentless. Oh, they're, they're after chasing they're like the boys. Delilah. Yes, they're chasing yeah. the boys, relentless. <laughs> And then we have some that wish they weren't, and they were, and they wish they were the other, and that's even more confusing. You finally get a girl, and she says, I wish I were a boy. I don't know what to do with that. Anyway. Not that my kids have had that experience, but all bets are off this day and age in the dating world. Going back to Samson. Um, choose wisely. <laughs> and... Uh, don't jump impetuously into relationships with questionable people. Now I tell them, choose for like instead of love. Choose somebody you like. Because <laughs> you don't know what love is yet. No, no, love is fleeting. Like is much better. It's lasting. Mm -hmm. If you like somebody and you get along with them and you have things in common, a friendship will carry you a lot further. And that's the companionship of God. Yes, it does. <laughs> and when your basis of love is physical attraction and not real... Yes, it's common ground and compatibility. <laughs> That's what I said. It's, yep. it's that love, Three lust. Yeah. With money. Which was the Samson's yes. idea of love. Yeah. You know, it was lust. And it was more about gratification of himself. It has a yeah. expiration date on it. Yeah. In many days. Um, as we just quite kind of close out Samson here, and, and um, I... I uh, <coughs> I look at the uh, the last section. Of the, the death of Samson is pretty pretty, I think, common Bible story, which is why I, why I kind of left it out. But thanks, Bob, uh, Dick, for going back and you know, reviewing that part because uh, that's really where the the heart of the story lies. Is the guy who is very self-centered becomes self-sacrificing in the end. And if he would have just done it all along, it would have ended differently. But then we wouldn't have this story from which we learn from right. about our own pride and our own prejudice and our own struggle with humility. Um, that's what I take away from Samson. So uh, just a couple questions to think about or as you deal with people. Um, do you tend to downplay your own abilities? Do you know somebody who does? What steps can you take to, to change that? If we sometimes are tempted to downplay our own abilities, what should you tell yourself? Well, one of the things is, is God uses the weak. Yeah. And if he can talk through a mule, he can talk through me. And you know, if, we can, if faith can tear down a mountain without any tools, he, he can strengthen me. And, and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm God's child in Christ. And I have value and worth. And that, that's not boasting. That's boasting in the Lord. The other side is, if you feel a little too proud of yourself, what should you do to change it? Same thing. God uses the weak. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you? Is it my strength? Yep, exactly. And so really, the same answer remedies both problems. Same medicine for both symptoms of pride and, and uh, despair. And that is, the Lord uses the weak. Which means he will give me the strength 
And the Lord uses me. That's great self-life affirming. But then the Lord uses me. <laughs> and I need to be cautiously optimistic in that. Realize that I can be my own worst enemy sometimes and tread lightly when it comes to the human ego. And that's always a, a good uh, balancing act. Um, is there anyone or anywhere in life where you might feel you have a false sense of control? <laughs> How does God change that one? Like a child, he gives us choices and lets us think that we have control of something. And does he sometimes make things happen where you're forced to let loose of the control? Yeah, you and you have to time, trust exactly. him with it. <laughs> all the time. He uses the weak. <laughs> hey, Oops. What was that, Terry? Speed bump. Hit the brakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Real sad. Because I know what happens when I don't. <laughs> you lose the shocks, and, and then everything in the trunk goes flying. <laughs> they put you in a position that you have to depend on other people to get driven around. <laughs> you can do it with, with a pillow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and that's sometimes it's good when God gives us those reminders because they're sobering reminders of, ooh, I'm not in control, but I don't need to be in control because God is. And even when I don't have it, He does. And sometimes that comes in the form of others. Or it might be that I will be there then in the form of me for someone else to demonstrate God's love and control as He works through me and allows me to bless somebody. But if... But if he's going to use me to bless somebody, then I also got to be humble enough to allow him to bless me through others. And that's the tough one. Do you guys sometimes have a hard time allowing people to bless you, to be kind to you, to do things for you? No, 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 I got it. No, no. Just let them bless you. <laughs> that, that's a tough one. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. They could, they could, they could run and work their heart out last summer to put my shed together. That was hard for but, me. But what do you got in that shed now? <laughs> my snow board, my But it was way. fun for us. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of stuff in there. Did you get, did you watch? Were you the foreman? Well, I watched. Oh, did you, well, you should have seen that whip. <laughs> <laughs> it kept the coffee flowing. <laughs> But you know what? They, they had fun doing it. And, uh, and now your snowblower is covered, and we didn't get any snow. So, see, they, they all worked out for everybody's benefit. Because if your snowblower was sitting outside, still we probably would have got snow. So, thank you guys for changing the weather. <laughs> now we're all going to suffer in the summer because we don't have enough moisture. Exactly. And your garden's not going to grow. So, way to go, Dick. Once again, that's all you do. Get back when you start. <laughs> but I, I, that's, that's imitating Christ's humility. That, that whole just little exchanger. Don, you were, you were expressing Christ's humility. I know it was hard, but you said, I submit. I'll let you do this. And I will be glad for it. And they did it, and they were better for it. And together, the two of you expressed humble gratitude um, and appreciation. You both blessed each other. And that's, you know, those are ways we can look how we can imitate Christ in our lives and not Samson. And yes, he was chosen by God. I don't want to downplay him too much. He's mentioned in the book of Hebrews 11, I believe. He's in the Hall of Faith chapter, if I remember correctly. Although, I think he is, right, Ned? I think Samson is in the Hall Faith. We'll have to check real quick. I don't want to put him in somewhere he shouldn't be. Um, it goes on and on about that man. Gideon and Jephthah, Samson, he's right there. Gideon, Barak, or Barak. Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the, the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. So, 
better than being in Hebrews chapter 11, I know our names are all written in a different annal, and that's the book of life. And, and so, go out there and be Christ imitators um, in uh, service to him. With that, let's close with a prayer. And I'll just use the one in the book. Lord God, help us to be vigilant and aware of our pride in the world around us. We pray that you would keep our hearts far from it and, and ever lead us to rely on the, the power of the Spirit to fight against sinful pride. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In uh, Next week we'll have class, but then the following week, the 5th of February, I have to be gone for a week uh, for some training I'm doing in Georgia, of all places. So uh, we'll have class next week, and then we'll take a break. So just to give you a fair warning. I thought you were taking off to go to the Super Bowl. I'm flying out the day of the Super Bowl. Oh, no. So, and now, in a typical airline fashion, I have to go to Oakland to go to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, it is Southwest. Yeah, but Delta was even worse. So, um, so I think they just got to pull back the slingshot and let us go. <laughs> Belt up there. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully we'll land. Yeah. So thank you for the study and the comments and the, all the good things that you bring to the class. We're all for time zones. Yeah, I get to do that. I never thought about that. Which means I might end up landing when I started. Exactly. <laughs> I just don't like flying. Not that I get scared of being in the air, it's just airports. People going through security. Yeah, I'm tempted to go. Yeah. I'm tempted to pay the 200 bucks and just get the TSA, free TSA thing and be done with it. If you're doing a lot of flying, it makes sense. Yeah, I don't do enough to justify yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> There's but, so much, much redundancy here in America, too. And uh, coming back from Europe, we went through one checkpoint. Here in uh, three years, we went through four. Yeah. The same, and they all checked their passport. They all screened them. That's because we don't trust foreigners, foreigners in our country. <laughs> <laughs> and I was that's a the problem. <laughs> and I was a foreigner. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> but I live here. That's too bad. <laughs> you came from Germany. That's right. You're dangerous. That's why I can't get blood. Even now. Because you came from Germany? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. I can't get blood. I've tried several times. From just because? Mad oh. cow disease. Mad cow. Yeah. About 10 Same years here. ago. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm I used to give it all, all the time years. until yeah. mad cow. Until it <laughs> And it was like, if I had mad cow, cow, I'd be dead right now. Yeah. You'd be dead. Yeah. We'd be sick. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You'd be dead. Yeah. My brain would go, yeah. What you get? Boom.
Anybody still here? No. Well, I had to turn that coffee off, don't I? Shoot. Yeah, I can't keep him in here. 